everybody, what's up? It's Casey, uh, and this is week two of our new series called What About, where we're exploring uh, six different questions that deserve some attention. Uh, much of this is coming from the Barna Group and the research they did as to why millennials are no longer part of the faith communities. It goes beyond millennials, but that's kind of like where we're launching off. And so week one was what about God and culture? Uh, week two is what about God and meaning? And so I'm going to try to handle in 10 minutes what about God and meaning? This is our 10 minute recap, so I'll do my best. Um, so uh, as it pertains to meaning, one of the first things that you have to deal with is um, what is your source of meaning? Uh, and so there's, there's two types of kind of perspectives on this. There's uh, what you would call current culture and Jesus culture. So current culture, uh, their source of meaning would come from places uh, like secularism and, and pluralism. Uh, so secularism would be kind of a heightened view of self, a heightened view of the here and now, and kind of like um, uh, uh, their, their, their baseline for meaning or their source for meaning would be the individual and, and like uh, that, that particular person highlighted. And in pluralism, uh, that's sort of an everybody gets an equal voice at the table. And so I don't want to like um, just slam pluralism because it actually is one of the things that allows believers in Christ to still have a voice at the table. Uh, but it does kind of like secularism come back to if everyone wins, then the, the ultimate source of meaning kind of depends on you. And so um, if we were to generalize current culture and where current culture um, derives their source of meaning, it would be um, individuals, like the person, me. I would get to define meaning. In Jesus culture, that's a completely different culture. That's a culture that's focused on Jesus. And Jesus uh, basically says that he is how you define meaning in life. And then he points to the word of God as um, the source that tells the most about him. It's like God's revealed um, uh, heart uh, for humanity and for them finding meaning. And so um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to explore with you in the time remaining um, a little bit of the reliability of the source of both Jesus and the word of God. Like, are those reliable sources um, as it pertains to meaning? Because um, Jesus can make some incredible claims and the word of God can make some incredible claims but if they're not reliable sources then we really probably should look elsewhere for our source uh, of, of meaning and uh, so yeah so uh, let me just talk to you a little bit about where Jesus lands on this idea of meaning and then we'll explore his reliability and the reliability of, of the word of God in in John chapter 11 Jesus is responding to um, this woman who is not happy about how life is turning out and he says I am the resurrection and the life Whoever believes in me though. He die yet shall he live and everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die Do you believe this? So Jesus was not shy about saying basically like look here's the deal. I am life. I'm where you find life I am meaning in life come to me explore me pursue me and you will find your meaning the Word of God then tells the same story over and over and over again about where we can find meaning. We find it in the person of Jesus. Are they reliable is the question. Well, I'm going to try to give you three different perspectives on um, some supporting uh, data that would say they are reliable, but ultimately you'll have to make that decision on your own. And, uh, so the first one is significant evidence, and we'll talk about a verifying event and then uh, compelling examples. So significant evidence. Um, first of all, uh, what did Jesus have to say about the Word of God? We had a lot to say about the Word of God, but basically um, he fully believed that the Old Testament, because that's what he was dealing with in his time, was 100% the inspired Word of God. There's several references in the scriptures where Jesus is referring back to the Old Testament and um, he looks at it as though this were the divine, the divine um, God-inspired word. It was like God's commandments. This is, this is the heart of God through authors. And so Jesus himself felt like the Old Testament was um, divine in its nature. And then he also says that the New Testament is going to be divine as it's written 
because he talks about how the Holy Spirit's going to come and he's going to teach all of the disciples um, and essentially all of the authors of the New Testament what they need to know and what they need to remember about everything that God wants recorded in his word. Um, and so, uh, first off, we have to understand that the Bible says and believes that it is a very reliable source. Now, again, if you don't believe the Bible, you don't believe Jesus, then you could potentially throw that out. But uh, as we're going to see here, uh, Jesus is a, is a very reliable source. Um, and so uh, what are some other significant uh, pieces of evidence that would say that uh, the scriptures are indeed a reliable source for meaning, for finding meaning and purpose uh, in life? And um, so what, just kind of like running through our list here, um, there's a uniqueness to the scripture uh, that you can't find in, in many other documents, and not even many other documents, any other document. Let me read to you something from Norman Geisler. Um, and I said that in this 10 minute uh, section, I would be uh, telling you the sources that I used uh, in, in this uh, preparation, and, uh, and so I wanna do that. And so some of the sources that uh, I used, oh, they're right over here, don't go anywhere. Got him. Okay, Lee Strobel. You might want to do a little research on your own. I would, I would sure hope so because again, um, this this can't totally cover it all in in the uh, remaining four minutes that I have. But Lee Strobel, Josh McDowell, John Piper, Norman Geisler, um, NYApologetics.com, um, John O'Brien, Daniel Devlin, and uh, Shane and Allie Curran. These are people from our church who actually did research uh, for this message as well. So I wanted to. Uh, to thank them in, in uh, this time as, as well. And so here's, here's what he says, Norman Geisler, about um, the unity of the scripture. He says um, that it manifests a unity that would indicate there is one mind behind its writing. It was written over a period of some 1,500 years or more. It is composed of 66 different books, 40 different authors, composed in three different languages. It has discussion on hundreds of topics. It was written in a variety of different literary styles. It's composed by authors of many different occupations, and yet in spite of this vast diversity, the Bible reveals an amazing unity. And so what he's saying here is basically, guys, like the scriptures all tell one story. And here's the story, that there is a God who loves us and is on a pursuit to win us back, even though we've sinned, even though we've fallen, even though there's a, a gap between this God and us based on sin and, and the consequence of sin being separation from God and death, there's a God who's on mission to win us back. He's going to send somebody to fulfill that mission. That person is Jesus. Jesus comes, goes to a cross, dies our death, is resurrected on the third day, overcomes sin and death, and then offers us the opportunity to, by faith, trust his finished work so that we could be restored and reconciled back to God and then used to tell that message and bring renewal to all the world. All of scripture, even though it's got those 40 different authors written in all those different places, different languages, even though there's such diversity in the way it came about, all of scripture points to that one story of God redeeming a people and this world for himself. Pretty amazing stuff, but it doesn't stop there. There's ancient manuscripts, man, that are, um, you know, as, as uh, the, the research revealed, um, for an ancient manuscript to, to like have copies, uh, you know, there's about 10 copies of some of these other ancient manuscripts that we would value as like, wow, like that's legit manuscript. The, the scriptures, the Old Testament and the New Testament, have a ton of ancient manuscripts about, like, and what that means is, like, I think the, there's 3,000 copies of the Old Testament or, or over 3,000 copies, and I think it was 24,000 or some huge number of New Testament um, copies. And basically, what that says is when you have that many copies of an ancient document, it's super legit. Um, the copying process was on point for the scriptures. Uh, in, uh, there, there was these uh, scrolls that were found by the Dead Sea, and they were a thousand years older than the latest copies of, um, I think it was the book of Isaiah that we had. And what they found was the, the copies that we had of Isaiah 
dating all the way back to a thousand years prior to that, man, they were like perfectly synced. A few grammatical errors, but the content was perfectly synced. And so what that says is the copying process was super on point. Archaeology, man, basically it's saying that as we discover stuff in archaeology, it matches what the Bible already said. A um, couple other things uh, as far as that I think are, are pretty pertinent to this. Science um, keeps revealing that the scriptures have had it right the whole time. Uh, and there's things in the scriptures that are like coming to life uh, as, we as we discover them in science. The author's life, integrity, and willing to, willingness to suffer and die for this stuff. And then uh, prophecy. Like Jesus fulfilled over 300 prophecies. He's going to get the rest when he comes back. But just the fact of like one guy trying to randomly fulfill eight prophecies is like trying to fill the state of Texas with thin mint cookies two feet deep, marking an X on one of them, mixing them all around, blindfolding yourself, and then hoping to pick out the X after a few years of wandering around the state. That's the likeliness of one guy fulfilling just eight prophecies. Jesus fulfilled 300, and he's going to be fulfilling all of them when he comes back. And so, man, just prophecy, I love that. Uh, last two here, running out of time, just want to make sure we get, we get to these. A verifying event. There's no more verifying event than the resurrection of Jesus. When you're dead and you come back to life, people need to listen to what you're talking about. Jesus, through his death and resurrection verifies the scriptures. He verifies his reliability, which says all of the scriptures are incredibly reliable. And the last one I wanna share with you is just changed life. Come meet somebody who's been born again. Meet somebody who finds their meaning in Christ and you will see, you'll trace their life and there will be no explanation for their life outside of the reliability of scripture and the person of Jesus Christ. Hey, my time's up, um, but hopefully you've been uh, Maybe challenged, maybe, maybe you know, encouraged to think more about this sort of thing. But um, when somebody claims to be the life and the resurrection, you should totally check out their reliability and, uh, and see for yourself if that's uh, somebody that you can, uh, can roll with. So love you guys, and uh, we'll see you next week.